The Villain's Demand reviews Avengers Disassembled, written by Brian Michael Bendis and pencils by David Finch. Hey guys, this is The Villain's Demand. I'm Evan the Great. This is Justin Von Doom. This is Hero Man. Today we're here to give you all another comic book review. It's over Avengers Disassembled. You can find that in Volume 1 of Avengers, issues 500 through 503. Uh, the book starts off uh, with Jack of Hearts. Uh, he shows up. He blows up. He's been dead, they all thought. Uh, killing Scott Lang, the new Ant-Man. And so tragedy strikes the Avengers. And through this tragedy, it just keeps building. Like, Tony loses his mind during a conference. The Vision shows up. Ultron's attacked. So they're trying to figure out what's going on. And... Through all this, they kind of find out that one of their own, which we'll get into, is the one behind it all, but they don't even really realize that they're doing it. Uh, so they call in the white alert, all the Avengers come in, the shield's there, and they're having to try to overcome this and get over the fact that one of their own is what brought this upon the Avengers as a whole. Um, if you've never read Avengers, this would actually be the big, big starting point. Um, this is the Michael Bryan Bendis run. I mean, basically all your stuff that's been heavy through Marvel is based on his work, based on this work right here. And uh, for us growing up, this is basically the biggest jumping point for comics as us, as friends, and even most of our friends. Um, up until this time, I had been reading comics since I was a kid, but I read just like Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, I was big on the Predator Alien books. Uh, Batman here and there didn't really pick up a lot and then once this book come out uh, it just opened the floodgates personally for me for a ton of titles and I still pick up Avengers to this day uh, yeah, I'm the same I used to read uh, I didn't read a whole lot of books I read some X-Men books and I'm a big follower of like the X-Men cartoon Spider-Man cartoon I was I was hard into all of those, and then I read a little bit of X Men, and when this book came out at our local shop, we used to go to Cars and Comics Plus. Yes, it was the Shame greatest thing out ever. There. <laughs> uh, because to that, I mean, every time we went to the comic book shop, I, I picked up a book here and there. But then we all just kind of, to me, it felt like that's when our comic group just really got hard into it. Whenever we started reading Avengers Disassembled, because it just blew my mind. It had a lot of cool things in it but that book opened up the floodgates for me as well and the, the story itself is just amazing uh, like he said we're going to try to break it down a little bit but there's a lot of uh, there's a there, it's mainly about um, Hawkeye, Captain America, Scarlet Witch um, who else am I missing the, the main character? I'd say Iron Man are probably yeah. your centerpieces of the book yeah they got like a centerpiece group and then some stuff goes down like he said Jack of Hearts shows up and then after that they're trying to figure out what happens. Everybody's there. And then the Vision shows up. And he has these Ultron balls roll out. And there's like uh, five or six of them. And they all five of them. yeah, they all pop out. And they're all freaking out. Because Ultron itself is a badass. So you, now you got five of them here on, on your, you know, right in your front yard. And uh, they combat that for a while. And they're trying to figure out what all is going down. And from that point forward... Um, that's the where all the other Avengers start showing up, and then they have everybody there, and and Nick's trying to get everybody to get off of it because the Shield, you know, he wants Shield to take care of it, and there's a little bit of bickering going on, and then, um, yeah, I think that's where She Hulk is that, is that when she goes crazy. No, she goes crazy before Shield shows. Up. Yeah, she goes crazy before Shield yeah. goes up, and that's kind of the first sign you get that something's going on that's not right because she just goes crazy, man, and she's like trying to beat up the Avengers, and and Iron Man shows up, and he fi he finally shows up, and he's able to knock her out and get her under control and and I'll let him finish up what happened after that. Uh, this is also the book that got me in the comics. Uh, you can pretty much take everything Evan the Great said, copy and paste it. Uh, for me, uh, that's exactly how I got into it, how I started reading comics. Uh, this was the first issue that I followed and read all of it. Uh, so it holds a, a deep part in my heart just like it does these guys. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, my favorite part of the book, I believe, uh, is when She-Hulk loses her mind. Uh, especially for me, I didn't know she could do that because I just started reading comics. Uh, she 
you're expecting the Hulk. Yeah. In a sense, yeah. And I always knew, I knew who the She-Hulk was, and I, I thought she just stayed, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like she was. And she starts freaking out, and like throughout the panel, she's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, it all starts because their friends are dying. All this is happening. Nobody understands why yet. And she's just getting bigger and bigger. She's destroying these Ultron drones. And then they're like, you need to calm down. And then uh, Captain America, being the awesome guy that he is, he steps up and says, you need to step down, calm down, or I'll put you down. And, of course, that's a threat. So she starts, she punches him, uh, knocks him back. She grabs a car, and she's about to try to kill him. Uh, the Captain Britain, she's trying to do stuff. Uh, she'll, or they're in the background, a couple that are there. They're like, we need to call in the Hulk ta uh, Hulkbuster Task Force. Everybody's freaking out. She smashes Cap with the shield. He's just stuck under the car. During all this, you see Iron Man fly in from like like a rocket, just <laughs> down in one shot or boom, lay her out. Uh, to me, that part of the book I just loved, Cause especially reading it for the first time. I've never read anything about She Hulk. Uh, I didn't see that coming. I didn't even know she could do it. And so that to me is uh, I feel like is a big reason I followed the book and even rereading it. I fell in love with that part all over. You know, it's like I almost forgot that it happened, and I just got into it. To me, it's it's almost the same thing because, like I said, I never read hardly anything Marvel up until this point. Uh, with a friend of mine hanging out, you know, I'd, I've read some Hulk books, some uh, Wolverine titles, but reading that and that movie right there, I think, is what grabbed me. And then, I mean, it just cascades from down there, like where the Kree show up. The Ultron drones, <laughs> and then in the end, which, you know, spoiler alert, if you haven't read this, which you probably should have by now, when you find out it's the Scarlet Witch, and then she starts making everybody's, like, biggest fear show up, and I'm thinking, wow, this is awesome, why have I not been a reading Avenger since then? Well, then, within years, I kind of realized, okay, well, there's a reason you don't read Avengers all the time, because it's not always like this, and it's almost a disappointment, but let's start from the beginning of the book. Um... Jack of Hearts shows up at Avengers Mansion. You know, they're just kind of having almost like an off day. Uh, it's kind of funny because Hawkeye and them are talking about who they would bang that they couldn't bang. <laughs> I forgot about and that. I think at, even at that point, now that, you know, I've read so many books that Hawkeye's in, it's almost like a development of the character. Marvel's starting to step away from the kitty stuff they've been doing for years at this time. And it's almost like sex is starting to play a big part into comics. You know, now that the millennium has turned. Uh, well, then after that, I mean, you even get to the biggest part where She-Hulk, I think that's what really starts the book off. Jack Hart's blown up, Scott Lang's dead. You know right there that this book is serious. And then when the Vision shows up, the Ultron drones come out. I was just like, whoa, which I didn't, I didn't even know Ultron had created Vision at the time. But that just blew my mind that, wow, you know, Ultron has implanted himself in Vision, and then you get to the... It, it, what's great about this book is so many questions. Because in, the, in my mind, I thought, okay, well, how? when did this happen? Has it always been like this? Because, you I mean, obviously the Ultron, you know, don't look like the original Ultron. But eventually, just by their make and their design, you can tell that at the time, maybe, when this had happened. And to me, I mean, just in that moment, you know, they're fighting the Ultron Jones, Vision's dead, and then She-Hulk just rips him apart. And just that page itself is just beautiful, just to watch. I mean, it's just right down the middle. And, and like, you know, Hero Man said, that's the staple of the book. And it is by far probably the best part of the book. And then another part I really like of the book, uh, She-Hulk really did it for us. And then you get, later on, they're trying to figure out what, what's going on. And then you get Doctor Strange. And at this time in comics, I'll be honest, I didn't know who Doctor Strange was. And this guy shows up, and after rereading it, you know, I, I'm a big Doctor Strange fan now. You just see how powerful he is and how much knowledge he can bring and everything about him. And he, he's the one that describes to the group, like, you know, it's one of your own. You know, he tells them it's Scarlet Witch. And Miss Marvel and a bunch of other ones are like, no, it can't be. You're lying. And they don't believe him. And eventually they find out it's definitely her. And... He's the one that they combat, and he's the one that basically has to, you know, take take her down. And towards the end of the story, once they find out she's the one doing all this, and they finally get her destroyed, not destroyed, but, you know, beat her, um, they're trying to figure out what to do with her towards the end of the book, and that's where Magneto shows up, and he takes his daughter, and he don't tell her, you know, he don't tell them where he's taking her. 
and she take he takes her away from this place but all the chaos and they all argue about chaos magic and and dr strange is telling her that she has all this hex magic and it's not like his through studies and and stuff like that it's just a gift given to her and she can't control it it's like maybelline thing. yeah she's born with it and reading this back then and now it just it's kind of cool because when we first read it, it was so crazy because I'm like, what is what is this chaos man they're talking about? What is all this? And then through the years, you find out that Scarlet Witch is very powerful. It's almost to the point where even now, I don't think she can control her powers that well at all oh. because many things happened after this. But in that story arc, you just see that she, she basically got people killed because she didn't know how to control her hex magic. Uh, Especially when there's, well, right off the bat, you kill what Scott Lang, Ant Man, uh, he dies, and then later on, spoiler alert, if you haven't read this, but that's where Hawkeye dies, because he comes out, and he's looking all, you know, like he's going to do something, and then he gets in a fight with the Crees, and uh, boom, he's dead. It's just crazy. Uh, the Wasp almost died too. She's yeah. in the hospital. I forgot about that. Because yeah, she smacked her. Yeah, yeah. It's the first time she's ever got knocked out and didn't go back to four of sides. So she's so little. They can't really even operate her on her. Uh, so, yeah, that's another one that, you know, at the time of reading this book, you don't know if she's going to make it or not. Uh, but I want to talk about my favorite character, and I really... Oh, okay. I just thought about something before you continue on. That, you just said that, and I don't know why I didn't think about this. She is so small, she can't operate. they got to lay her on the, like, giant pillow, you know. And yeah. Hank Pym's there. He's yellow jacket, you know, currently, even then, you know. But why can't he just shrink anybody down to operate on her? <laughs> I mean, I, literally, he has the tech. He can do it himself. Why not? I mean... They might have been worried that they'd start operating on her. And, and she'd get big, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. But still, said you, she always reverted back to her normal size when she was hurt. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I just thought about that. I'm like, why? I mean, e even after this, there's a book, Avengers Finale. This is kind of where the team breaks up. But, I mean, she's normal size then, but... It, it just why not? I mean, surely he could have saved her life within an hour, you know, because apparently she was small for a while. Yeah, well, what, so, what I thought, why didn't he just make her big? I don't know. Yeah, I guess I can yeah, do that. That's what I thought. But, I mean, that's a side note. My favorite character through it, and I really believe that rereading the book, I've never been able to pinpoint a reason why I like Hawkeye. But I've liked him pretty much ever since I've been reading comics. I play a game called Hero Flicks that I love to play Hawkeye. Mm -hmm. I just I've always liked the guy. I just thought it was all oh, like archers. But rereading this book, being the first real comic I've read, I give this book the credit. Why I like Hawkeye, his personality in this book, how he bounces off Tony in arguments, and just even with Nick Fury and all of them, his personality and he's you know what he stands for. It, it, like he wears his feelings on his sleeve about this stuff. You can tell that yeah. he's hurt, but he's verbal about it. And then you get to see how bad he really is. Like the Ultrons show up, and he's shooting five arrows at once and hitting them all in the mouth with uh, explosion arrows and stuff. You're like, man, this dude's bad. And then the Kree show up. And he's like, I need more arrows. He looks like a fucking porky pie. Yeah, and he runs <laughs> off, and he comes back, and he's got arrow, thousands of arrows just all the way down him. And he just starts unleashing on them, tearing them up. And he gets hit in the back with a blast. His back's on fire, and he's hurt, and he's hollering for help. And then Kree attacks him. And he's like, not like this, not like this. And he sets his jetpack off. He goes out and... Like this! Yeah, and then he like, the, the ship, goes yeah. out glorious. He flies the dude's jetpack, him and the Kree, into it and takes out their big ship. Uh, so, that, to me, I love that. And it, it made me sad rereading it that Hawkeye went out, he died. And, and I give this book credit to why I like Hawkeye. And I've... Till now, I've never really been on the pinpoint what started me to like him, and I give the, this book that credit. Um, you say that, and it's like, like I said, I've never read Avengers ever since this book. I've never stopped. I think, <coughs> so what, we're talking in 2004, so we're talking like the last 15 plus years. I don't think I've ever seen Hawkeye care so much about anything except for this event. Because, you know, if you know Hawkeye's past about, you know, the drunken father winds up with a drunken stepdad, join the circus, doing a trick shot, brother being raised as a thief, Barney, uh, you know, this is like almost the first thing he cares about besides his brother, and then you see it tore from him, and it normally, if you read anything with about he's not, he does never seem this emotional, yeah. and then to watch him pour out of this, and it's a good comparison in this book with him and Cap, because Cap is trying to be cool, calm professional about the whole thing and then Hawkeye is almost to the point where like 
there's no need for professionalism here. It's, you know, this is his family. It's being attacked. And it is. It's a really good piece to watch him in the book, you know, to just watch him emotionally do all this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think what's the great, one of the greatest things about the book itself is just Wanda. Uh, what she does in this book carries on for almost a complete decade, almost all the way up until uh, Avengers vs. X-Men. I mean, Warbird, Miss Marvel, now Captain Marvel, um, she she is the one female of Avengers during all this that is very shook up about it. Um, out of all the females, she probably has the most dialogue in the book. And, you know, you, there's times where you see Cap holding her, she's crying. Hawkeye's holding her, she's crying. And she's all, why, why, why? And then this hatred that she grows for Wanda in this book carries all the way out until Avengers vs. X-Men, where she still hates Wanda and blames Wanda for all this. Now, in comic time, you know, that might be a span of two, yeah. three years. But, you know, for ten years, she has been written to hate Wanda. And even now, I can't even think that she's even reconciled with the fact that what Wanda had done to them. Because up until recently, the Avengers have never been the same until I would probably say this Hickman run that's, well, I guess ended now with Secret Wars. But I think that's what's great. And I guess that's a testament to how Bendis writes books. Because after this, he wrote a new Avengers, started by Avengers after Civil War, well, during Civil War. And then those books ran, and then he just started another regular Avengers title, and then another new Avengers title. And he basically wrote Avengers all the way up till, well, I guess after... Avengers vs. X-Men, and the entire time it has been stuff like this. It's a lot of character interaction, emotions, and it's really written great. And it opens the door for a lot of good character growth. It opens the door for a lot of characters that you really wouldn't know of. It's brought a lot of characters to the front. I mean, like uh, Warbird, I really didn't know who Warbird was, Miss Marvel, and now she's literally my favorite female character. And then even later on with uh, the, just to get off, a little bit off topic, look at Iron Fist, who I lo- who I love. You know, he's one of my favorite characters. And Luke Cage, he's really taken a lot of characters from this story, and then characters later on, and really brought them to the front with his Avengers books. And that has been great for Marvel. It's been great for fans, and obviously by the cinematic universe, it's been great for business. Another thing I like about the book is they they start out with Iron Man, which I'm a big fan of. And he's actually Tony Stark, and he's the Secretary of Defense for the United States. And he's at a press conference, and he's just blaming people, and he just he's going off. And basically, he loses his job over this, and the UN wound up firing him. And then, right before he's telling Cap and them about this, is when Yellow Jacket walks in, or well, Hank Pym. Oh, well, they're they're up there with him. Hank yeah, and oh, yeah, the Wasp are up there. And he's, Not the Wasp, Scarlet Witch. Like he, he comes in, and he is so mad at Tony, and he's like yelling at him. He, he was drunk. He shouldn't have been up there. All sorts of stuff. And he's like, I was not drunk. And that was like a big part of the story because usually when Tony messes up, it's because he was drunk. And it, well, he's been sober for and years. And he's sober. Time. And they was almost mad enough I thought he was going to fight each other. Yeah. And that's a really good part in the book. Whoever wrote that dialogue right there that's really showed Bendis. that... The, well, Bendis. I keep forgetting that. He, he showed the intensity of the characters. It's almost like um, it's been bullying for a while, but I can see Tony probably making... He made hundreds of mistakes at this point. And then be Secretary of Defense... And then to go up there, basically, basically start a war, basically, and get fired, and, and then they're all blaming him about it. And it just shows you the power of what Scarlet Witch can do, at, even at that point of the story. And it's just it blows my mind. Well, on, on on top of that, it also shows you to Tony how big his sobriety and his trouble being an alcoholic is, because okay, him and him and Hank get into it at the UN, you know. At the UN conference, Scarlet Witch is the one that even brings up, you know, you're are, are you drunk? And he says, no, you know, but I feel it, and I haven't had a drop, you know. Then Ant, Ant- oh, Man, which he is Ant Man, Hank shows up. They get to the big <laughs> argument, right? I mean, it affects just that moment affects him so much that he almost takes it more personally than what's happened to the Avengers, because when he shows up after um, after Jack of Hearts blows up the mansion. He's sitting there talking about it. H- Hank shows up and is accusing him in front of everybody, yeah. and it pisses Tony off so bad 
that with everything going on, he leaves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which eventually comes back there towards the end. But, I mean, that goes back to where I was talking about business and his writing. Tony is putting his sobriety, the insult from Hank, personally so much that he is not even worried that the Avengers, which I'm sure he is worried, but he's putting that above what's going on at the mansion. And, you know, that is... That right there just goes to how well Bendis writes characters, emotion, ties the story up with it. It's it's, it's beautiful. It's almost like uh, he writes Tony perfect. It is beautiful because a lot of times I see Tony do this. They'll get in trouble, and it's almost like he's done this more than once, and he'll pick himself over the group, and then he'll get out there and recognize the mistake he made, and he'll come back. And usually when he comes back, it's at the right time. I think them couple pages that we've been talking about of dialogue were incredible. Like the part y'all missed is it started off with Cap and Tony saying this isn't just, you know, a bad day like Hawkeye was it's saying. It's the worst day. Yeah, they're like, this yeah. is an attack. And Hawkeye's like, no, we're, you know, we have, we're not just normal people. We don't have good and bad days. We have incredibly bad days and incredibly good days. And, and then Hank shows up and starts accusing Tony. So y'all have already covered all that. But most of them believe, beside Hank, that Tony is probably right. Yeah. Except for Hawkeye. Hawkeye's like, well, I don't know, you know, I had a drunk dad, and I believed a lot of mm -hmm. lies when I was growing up. And he was like, you know, it is easy to slip. So Hawkeye's bringing a perspective that nobody else in that group has. He's dealt with alcoholics that lie to you and say they're done, but they always go and get, you know, and then they'll deny it. So he's dealt with that. So he's bringing a different perspective. And so it was really, Hawkeye had just as much to do with teeing him off and running him off as Hank did. Because Hawkeye was pushing buttons on him. Basically, it was the one calling him a liar and saying, you know, it does happen. It's okay. And you, you say that, and you're also, and you're also, you're right. I don't know if you're realizing it, but he also does bring another perspective. Of what's going on? Because he's like, we had this coming. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's a, that's the one thing he keeps bringing up from that moment on. It's you know, like we're the Avengers. We've had this coming. You know why? You know he's wondering why no one sees this, and you know because. The Avengers are heroes. For years, they've been trying to work with the UN to become like a peacekeeping force. And now, all of a sudden, it's blown up in their face. And he's the one guy that sees it differently, thinking that, hey, the Avengers have had this coming for years. You know, why don't we kill people? And that's, you know, that's your, that's the biggest topic with heroes, you know, throughout just comic history. And, you know, unless you're the Punisher, why don't we stop these people when we're there? You know, why don't we, why don't we kill Kane, you know? It's, well, it's, well, they even bring it up with Ultron. You can't really kill Ultron. He's AI, but you know, why don't you know we kill these guys and stop them? And you know, that's he's only point person at the time who's bringing this up, and it's on. And it, you know, he makes perfect sense because if you would have killed villains, there would be no need for heroes. And that is his. That is a different perspective he has than everybody else at this time. And it's just like I said, you know. He's the one person who seems to be the most sporadic with emotion through this whole thing, and it is. It's great. It's, he, he understands, like you were saying, that they brought this upon themselves, and mm -hmm. he talks about it like, oh, we go save, do something in space. You know, we stop them. That's good enough. Now we head back to Earth because there's a different threat, you know, mm -hmm. because whatever. And it, just like you touched on, it, it's really, they did this. They, they would halfway solve a problem just good enough to get it taken care of and then leave. They didn't follow yeah, up. Yeah, not finish it. Nothing. They would just go on to the next one because they're Avengers. And, it, and and if you keep playing that out, eventually that snowball is big enough. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it caused some damage. Yeah, you cause an avalanche and, on yourself. And he, he brings that up and it just goes to show how good this book is written. Like it has all these characters that you just attach to and their emotions and I can't say enough about it. And if you haven't read it, you need to read it. You need to read it. And yeah. if you it's have great. read it, it's you need great. to reread it. Because I liked it more the second time than I did the first time. It's funny that you say rereading it. I've read this story so much. Like, every time a big event would happen, I guess there towards Civil War, I'd always reflect back on this book, and I would read it just to kind of see the cogs that Bendis was putting in his story, starting with this book. Because a uh, Secret Invasion happened, spoilers, Scrolls are fucking everywhere. Um, one of the biggest scrolls is Hank Pym. And I, I, I specifically remember the scene where they're at the UN, and he's just got this look given to Tony. And at the time, I thought, man, is he a scroll then? How? And then, you know, because 
he goes back and he's he's crying when the wasp is in the hospital but you read secret invasion and they're talking about how you know the scrolls are implanted with to be that person they don't know until it's triggered that they're a scroll you know and then with this book i kept going back to events like that and just watching the gear slowly turn in this book to lead towards all these events and like i've said i'll probably continue to talk about that as long as we're in this book that bendis writing is just magnificent i mean literally to this point he almost runs marvel to a degree i mean everything he writes is like comes through the avengers books and it's just brilliant another the other part i like about the book overall is that bendis he takes at this point you know in the, the group of avengers he used for this book he don't even have some of like the the, the heavy hitters you know, the Hulk's not in this book, Thor's not in this book, Spider-Man's nowhere to be seen. Oh, Spider-Man's in the book. Spider oh, he's, he's, book. Not a, he's not yeah. really an Avenger. I forgot he is in the book, and he has like a couple comedy lines. I forgot about that, but he ain't a big part of the book, and the other ones ain't in it That at no all. one else finds funny. <laughs> and yeah. uh, he's trying to joke about something that's probably should have been joking and about, they, but it was funny. They yeah, get like, mad like, at him. like Vision. Yeah. He's a robot, and they all kind of look at him. <laughs> what told me he was a robot? Android. What told me he was a robot? You know? And they're like, why are you here? You're not an Avenger. And another... another uh, characters that they used uh, was uh, the Falcon. I, don't, I, I forgot how much dialogue he had in the book, but it was a lot more than what I thought. And he's kind of... He almost had more dialogue than Captain America did. It was weird. I didn't like the Falcon in this book. I didn't he, like he the either, yeah. I'm just saying he had more dialogue than he yeah. did. It was, it was so strange that you take characters... But what I'm getting to is he takes care like almost the, the lower end Avenger characters, he can make them, like Justin said, uh, Justin Von Doom, he can make them just as big. And he, and he does that. I mean, and then you, you talk about like Falcon and how you didn't like his character. Think about if this was written now with the way all these characters have been built, yeah. how much more epic it would be. I mean, it would be mind blowing. Like you talk about, you know, oh, I don't like Falcon in this book, but he is such a big character now. And I mean, even then, during Disassemble, they were trying to make him a big character because the Captain America book was Captain America and the Falcon. Yeah. And look at how many times that book has been considered that or called that up until, you know, the year 2016. I mean, like I said, he's t he tries to take all these lower end characters and make them important again because it's almost like he takes the Avengers and makes them what they were, like maybe in the 60s and 70s, where it's not a core group of five people. But he it, he's taking everybody that's been an Avenger and trying to make them important and relevant again in comics. And like after this, you read uh, New Avengers, which you bring people in like, you know, Spider-Man becomes an Avenger, Wolverine becomes an Avenger. And you look at Mighty Avengers, and he is literally bringing in a great cast of Avengers, old, new, and ones that no one really cares about, and making them relevant. Uh, it just goes to show that just even your leaders aren't the only one that's touched by an impact. Exactly. You know what I mean? Even the people that are not thought of as being Avengers because they're not important, they're not powerful or whatever. When something strikes home, it, it affects everybody. Yeah. And it shows in this book. You know, the, the little people that you don't even realize. Like when they send out the white light, the, the uh, alarm, the call, yeah, the everybody shows up. And it just goes to show you that you know, Avengers is home, even for people that aren't Avengers anymore. Yeah, that even, holds a part in their heart. Even for Namor, who they were just fighting with the yeah. arc before this. He shows up, and Moon Knight's there. At the time, I didn't even know who Moon Knight was. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that dude looks awesome. <laughs> but, you know, and he shows up. The Fantastic Four, Spider-Man. Daredevil's even in Daredevil, there. Daredevil, yeah. And he's not even really an Avenger. And it just goes to show that when you take something as important and is loved, in the comic universe is the Avengers and you tear them down it affects everybody and he shows this through this book and I thought he did a great job at it and, it, and you plan that to wrap it up and get towards the end of the book um, Doctor Strange shows up starts talking about how you know one of them is doing that asking you know which Avenger knows magic and I don't know why he asked that because he knew Scarlet Witch had this magic he talks about how he delivered the kids that's what the whole book is over they do a flashback Wanda and Wasp are sitting there at the pool. She's talking about how she almost had a pregnancy scare. And then she slips up and brings up how Wanda's two kids. Well, Wanda, apparently, it, even at a time, I'm not even really sure because she actually has kids. She has uh, Wiccan and Speed from the Young Avengers. Like, they talk about how she willed these kids into existence. And Doc Strange is like, no, you know, I delivered those children. And then B steps up. 
And they talk about, no, you know, she willed those uh, children into existence. And so the whole book's over. And then, like, uh, the end of the book, you, you've got two people talking, and all you see is their lips. And it's her children manifested speaking, but she is speaking for them. And that is what ultimately set me off for this book is, wow, you know, it's an Avenger doing this. It's one of their own, it's a good guy, which, you know, when you think about Scarlet Witch, at one time she was, she's the daughter of Magneto. She was a mutant terrorist back in the day before her and her brother Quicksilver joined the Avengers. And that's when my mind was just completely blown with this book because all of a sudden it's her. And no one wants to believe it. No one wants to, like, in a sense, no one wants to stop her because they know they're going to have to hurt her. And, like I said, you've got all these epic parts in this book, but once it comes down to her and Doctor Strange, I think that, it, even though I don't think it's the greatest, it's the most epic part of the book because they're fighting, and then all of a sudden, that's when everybody's fears start manifesting. Yes. Dormammu shows up and blasts Doctor Strange. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the next, oh, um, Warbird, Miss Marvel, flies at her because that's, like I said, back, you know, earlier, that's where that hatred starts. And then out of nowhere, Rogue shows up. And I was like, what in the hell is going on? Because at the time, I've known, I've known just in general that, you know, that's where Miss Marvel had got her powers. You know, Rogue got her powers from Miss Marvel. They actually have a mutual hatred for each other. It's like, wow, why the hell is she here? And you flip and you've got that double spread page of everybody fighting their fears. Like, and, and some of them are interesting. Where Spider-Man's fighting himself. Wolverine is fighting Beast. And you just get all these mashups of everybody. Like, Captain America's fighting Red Skull. Mm -hmm. And just to know that, you know, shh, it ties into the motion of this book because Wanda knows everybody here. Even the Avengers to that great of a degree, how great the heroes are tied together with one another, that she's bringing everybody's greatest fears out. And like I said, even with Spider-Man, you know, mm -hmm. Spider-Man's fighting multiples of himself. And that's, the, the the climax of this book is just wonderful. And even though, like, Warren the Great said, and then when it's done, I think the, probably, to me, not not the She-Hulk or Vision, but I think the most beautiful piece of the book is Magneto. The way he's drawn, David Fincher does an awesome job of this. About that. When, when he comes out yeah. and his cloaks are just spread out, yeah. I, I have these books. Uh, yeah. I was wanting to bring them because, you, as you can see, we've been setting books up. All these books, every one of them signed by David Finch. I had the pleasure of meeting David Finch at New York Comic Con years ago. Really nice dude. Love his art and just the way he draws Magneto. It's almost like he's an yeah. angel. It, it, <laughs> man, it's just you know we're big RPG guys. I mean, it's like wow, look at this dude. He's like almost like an like an arch, like an arch mage, and he just the way he's cloaked. Because I've never seen Magneto drawn like that, and he is just beautiful. And then you think, oh God, Magneto's here, and he's like, what are you gonna do? Want to give me my daughter? And then you think the book is just gonna escalate even more, and Magneto is wise enough not to, and he takes her away. The uh, big fight scene is that the only scene that the Hulk shows up? Yeah, but there's there's thing. I don't think Banner's in the book. Yeah, I think he's somebody just manifested fear, as a fear. Yeah. yeah but I mean, I fear. think he's the only page that he shows up. Yeah, but he's right there in the center. Yeah, but see, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, the whole guy, yeah, he's a centerpiece, but I don't think Banner was, the, if he was, I, f see, that's one of the things, like, I know it's because he's got him by the head, and that's one thing I've always questioned, because you think Banner would have more dialogue in the book. And I, I don't know who that would be. It would, You would assume that it is, and that's a question of always. Maybe I should go back and look at that. Because you figure if it Banner was there, which Banner's not a part of the Avengers at the time, I don't see why he would show up for Code White because, you know, he has separated himself so much from the Avengers. But I don't recall him seeing him in the group at the end of that book because, you know, like, you see the group, Fury's in front of him. But I don't remember seeing Banner there. I, I thought it was just the Hulk. I yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I think, think it's just, just a Hulk. She brought him there. Yeah. And, uh, but anyways, you know, if you get a chance, watch watch the book. Read the book. Uh, it's beautiful. It's epic. It's the best way to kick off Marvel up until now if you're wanting to backtrack. But um, as you can tell right now, Secret Wars is almost over. Um, we're going to take the chance to cover a lot of event books between Marvel, DC, We've got a bunch of ongoing books we're going to start after Secret Wars for Marvel. We're going to backtrack over some DC stuff. Uh, we're going to cover some more independent stuff. So uh, look out for that. We're the Villains Man. I'm Justin Von Doom. He's Hero Man. He's having a great. Watch this on YouTube. Like us on Facebook. Send us some tweets out on Twitter. Keep reading, guys.